Leaving trails of steaming vapor in their wake, United States bombers bound for Berlin to destroy armament industries in and around the Nazi war capital. In their first daylight mission over the heart of Hitler's fortress, American bombers combined with British air forces are pounding Germany with raids around the clock. One propeller out, a bomber limps home. In all, 68 American planes failed to return. But the next day and the next, American bombers returned in follow-up raids. Today, squadrons like these in ever-increasing numbers are taking the war home to Germany itself. Back from her fourth wartime journey of mercy, the Swedish exchange ship Gripsholm arrives in New York Harbor. Aboard are 663 Americans, home from Nazi internment and prison camps. Wounded soldiers, war correspondents, and diplomats are among her passenger list. They bring first-hand news of conditions in Nazi-occupied countries. Douglas MacArthur, nephew of General MacArthur, was attached to the American Embassy at Vichy. Ralph Heinzen was Paris correspondent for an American news service. We're very glad to get home. We've been 13 months interned in Germany and 13 bad months for the Germans as well as for ourselves, because in those 13 months, Germany has lost the war. They know they're whipped, but they're wondering how they're going to get out of it. Past year, Hitler has lost tremendously his prestige, particularly as a military leader. All through Europe, there's a very fierce underground warfare going on against Germany. In every occupied country of Europe, but particularly in France, there is this mighty, organization of courageous patriots who are waging a war day and night against the forces of occupation. Home on leave after four years of battle, units of Australian fighting men get a thundering welcome as they parade through the streets of Sydney. Veterans of fierce desert campaigns in North Africa and rugged fighters fresh from victories in New Guinea, these gallant men fought side by side with their American allies. Australia's General Sir Thomas Blamey takes the official salute as the nation pays tribute to its heroic sons. transport plane lands at a Caribbean port. Aboard is Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, wife of the president, making the first stop in her latest tour of American army outposts. With General Shedd commanding garrisons in the Puerto Rican theater of operations, she reviews troops on guard in the Caribbean. In Australia, Mrs. Douglas MacArthur, wife of the Allied commander in the Southwest Pacific, sponsors a new destroyer built by Australian workmen. Listen, the Batan, and may God bless you. And His Majesty's Australian ship Batan goes down the ways dedicated to avenge the gallant fighters in the Philippines whose heroism will never be forgotten. Nazi prisoners of war at a camp in northern United States. In full accord with the Geneva Convention, prisoners are well-housed, well-clothed, and well-fed. 
Although prisoners are not required to work, many volunteer as lumberjacks, for which they are paid 80 cents a day. A snow shoveling detail. Prisoners keep their own camp in order. By doing work like this in the shoe shop, captives are able to buy cigarettes and other luxuries. War prisoners receive the same rations as American soldiers, or an equivalent in their own type of food if they prefer. These Signal Corps pictures show a fully equipped recreation room provided for the captives, who even have their own band. America scrupulously observes the principles of humanity in her treatment of war prisoners. Officers of the Allied military government draw up plans for the evacuation of thousands of homeless civilians from Italian battle areas. At one large estate, more than 10,000 Italians found refuge from fighting zones. Along every road in endless procession, refugees streamed toward collecting stations set up by the Allied military government. Many helpless families, made homeless by the German seizure of their country, were forced north during the Nazi retreat. Stripped of most of their possessions, only a few were adequately clothed or fed until the Allied Fifth Army landed. helpless people from the ruins of their shattered homes is one of the great rescue achievements of the war. The real tragedy is the plight of the very young. The world into which they were born has been a world of suffering and sorrow. Now the Allied authorities open the way to a new haven a haven where they may wait in safety for the day of peace. As swiftly as possible, army trucks take them to ports of embarkation. Here, giant LSTs, landing ships built to carry huge 30-ton tanks, take on their trucks and their human cargoes for transportation to Naples, a hundred miles down the coast. sanctuary in southern Italy. Here many Italians find new hope and new lives in liberated territory. Chiefs of the Allied Invasion Command at headquarters in England. America's General Eisenhower in supreme command as the United Nations concentrate the most powerfully armed force in history. Warehouses bulge with tons of supplies. Agreements reached at Tehran now being put into action. At hundreds of military depots, thousands of trucks, command cars, jeeps, all kinds of mechanized equipment are assembled for the day of invasion. With General Montgomery and Air Marshal Tedder, deputy commander, Eisenhower sees new equipment in action. Today, great fleets of troop carriers soar over Britain, releasing their hordes of parachutists. Spectacular rehearsal of things to come. Montgomery, victor over Rommel. Tedder, master of air tactics. Eisenhower, liberator of North Africa. The power and might of the United Nations trained and ready to strike a decisive blow from the West. 